retirement homes, and other congregate care settings. And at the outset of this pandemic, we had to make difficult decisions to limit outside visitors to these homes because keeping COVID out of these settings was our best line of defense. And I know how hard this was on families. Trust me, I, I, I know. I know the tremendous toll this has taken on people, not being able to see your loved ones. And for many families, not being able to be by the side of their loved ones in the final or most difficult moments is heartbreaking. It's hard to imagine anything worse. And it was a tremendous sacrifice. And we must never forget what these families had to go through. But looking back now, looking back on the devastation this virus caused in the homes that were hardest hit, I know this difficult decision was necessary. Because of the steps we all took, we've been able to keep the vast majority of homes outbreak free. This decision, as hard as it was, was the right decision. Together, we have saved countless lives. And I'm so grateful to all of the families who've worked with us. I'm forever grateful to everyone who listened. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you, and I thank all the families. As a province, we have risen to the occasion. We have met the challenge head on. And as a result of everyone working together, as a result of our collective efforts, as a result of our collective sacrifices, today, we're able to take an important step forward. Today, we're announcing a cautious restart of visits starting on June the 18th to long-term care homes, retirement homes, group homes, and other congregate living settings that are not currently in outbreak. We need families to be able to see their loved ones. And today, we're taking the first steps to help reunite, reunite families, to help reunite loved ones in the safest way possible. I know this day we have all been desperately waiting for, but we can't take our take this progress for granted. We can't forget that these settings are still vulnerable to COVID-19 outbreaks. So we must remain vigilant. We must move forward, but we must do it so carefully. And in the coming days and weeks, we will continue to monitor the situation closely. We're working on expanded visiting opportunities as soon as it is safe to do so. And nothing is more important because we're all in this together. Thank you so much, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll pass it over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, Premier. We are seeing the infection numbers stabilize in our long-term care homes, and that is thanks for the tireless efforts of staff, our hospital partners, and the Canadian Armed Forces. Our government's COVID-19 action plan to protect long-term care residents was a driving factor to get to where we are today. Aggressive testing, screening and surveillance, managing outbreaks and the spread of COVID-19 have resulted in encouraging results in our long-term care homes. In March, we made the difficult decision to restrict visitation at our long-term care homes to essential visitors only. That decision was not made lightly and I know how much it has affected our loved ones in long-term care, as well as their families. On the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, we have developed a responsible, phased visitation plan that will allow you to visit your loved ones in long-term care and retirement homes that are not in outbreak starting next week. The possibility of spreading COVID-19 into our long-term care homes and retirement homes is still a real threat, so certain conditions must be followed. In consultation with these sectors, we are resuming visitations under the following requirements. For long-term care homes, we are allowing one visitor per resident at a minimum of one visit per week for an outdoor visit only. Retirement homes will have outdoor and indoor visits with the number of visitors being left to the discretion of the home. 
to visit, you must have tested negative for COVID-19 in the past two weeks. Pass an active screening questionnaire. Clean your hands when you arrive and depart with soap and water or alcohol-based sanitizer. Wear a mask and stay in designated areas and maintain physical distance. Long-term care homes and retirement homes must not be in outbreak. They must maintain the highest infection prevention and control standards and have a system in place to schedule visits and communicate with families, staff, and residents. Our government will continue to work with the hardworking staff in the long-term care homes, our hospital partners, and the Canadian Armed Forces to keep our most vulnerable safe. Thank you. And now I'll pass it over to Minister Smith. Thanks, Minister Fullerton. Uh, because of each and every one of your efforts to fight the spread of COVID-19, individuals across Ontario will soon be able to have their visits outdoors with their loved ones in congregate care settings. Loved ones and individuals in these settings have been waiting for this day since early March. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you to the families who have been waiting patiently. And thank you to our frontline workers who have done amazing work. Uh, they've been working so hard to keep the individuals that they support safe. We'll be allowing two visitors per residence in outdoor areas of homes supporting individuals with developmental disabilities, shelters for survivors of gender-based violence, and children's residential settings. Our priority remains the health and safety of residents, workers, and visitors, and that's why in addition to allowing visitors, we will continue to deliver on our COVID-19 action plan for vulnerable people. This plan laid out measures to stop COVID at the door, contain the spread through infection control, and maintain staffing levels. And we need to continue proceeding cautiously, carefully, and correctly. And that means full adherence to infection prevention and control procedures by both staff and visitors at these settings. Congregate care settings will be responsible for implementing and communicating infection prevention and control protocols to visitors, which include active screening for all visitors, proof of a negative COVID-19 test within the previous 14 days, temperature checks, physical distancing during the visit, mandatory mask wearing, and disinfection of the outdoor area used for the visit. We ask all visitors to please, please, Take these guidelines seriously and listen to all the staff on site. They're doing everything they can to protect your loved ones and yourselves. This has been a very difficult time for our province, but it's been especially difficult for those separated from their loved ones, as the Premier mentioned. Today is an important first step in reconnecting these families. Thanks very much. We'll go to the phone line for questions. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. First question. First question comes from Rob Ferguson from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Hi, Premier. Um, a lot of families will be happy to hear this but I, I, uh, on the visits, but I think a lot of people are wondering in terms of the Woodbridge Vista nursing home, um, what took so long for the province to issue a takeover order for that? that home given the fact that a, an 82 year old man there died uh, over a week ago from exhaustion uh, caused by malnutrition um, surely there were signs uh, and you know the army uh, medical teams are in there now so what happened what went wrong and why didn't the government act faster on that one well Rob I'm going to pass it over to Minister Fullerton thank you a very Im important concern uh, we acted swiftly uh, all this process, making sure that we had um, IPAC, infection prevention and control groups, hospital teams in, in our homes that were in outbreak to assess them and uh, in an ongoing way to maintain communication with that home and to support that home. So this is a whole process in collaboration with the home and the supporting uh, hospital or armed forces as the case may be and uh, looking at how those homes are, are supported. So this is a collaborative effort, and before we take a mandatory uh, management um, uh, role uh, and, and complete that, every effort is made to collaborate with these homes. So it is a process. 
uh, you, you understand that we are improving. Our numbers are improving in terms of our red homes and our outbreaks are improving. Uh, many homes have resolved outbreaks now. And so in this particular concern, the issues surrounding um, this particular tragic case, there is an investigation ongoing with our inspectors right now um, to understand uh, the circumstances better. So I appreciate your, your question. Thank you. There's probably a, no, a lot of families um, still wondering, um, maybe they might still have their, their mom or their dad or their grandmother if the province had acted sooner. What do you say to that? And how many homes are still in code red? Our code red numbers are dropping daily. Uh, and we have about 67 homes still in outbreak. Of that, there are roughly, um, I, I would have to get that number for you precisely because it may have changed uh, during the day, but I can get that number from my staff for you. Um, but it is uh, uh, dozens now rather than, um, than the many that we had uh, prior to this. So it's moving in the right direction. Looking at the support that our families are receiving, it is important that they get in there. We, we acknowledge the significance that families play and caregivers and uh, the neighbors, friends, to be able to get back into the homes and support uh, our loved ones. So this is, um, this is an ongoing effort to understand how we can open up further. It has to be done in a measured way and we're taking the advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, through this very measured process. Next question. Next question comes from Ashley Legasic from News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Hi, Thank Ashley. you for taking my question. Thank you. I've spoken to a number of restaurant owners outside of the Golden Horseshoe who plan on reopening tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, they say things are not going very smoothly. They're getting calls every day with new guidelines, depending on the public health region that they're in. And they want to see a provincial approach instead of leaving the specifics up to each region. So my question is, will the province be providing more guidelines for businesses like restaurants? And if not, why not? Well, the provincial uh, guidelines and the protocol is very clear. I think we have uh, over uh, over 100 uh, guidelines from the Minister of Labour. And now keep in mind, every Chief Medical Officer of Health, if they want to add more stringent guidelines, um, they're, they're going to have to uh, deal with the local Chief Medical Officer. But our guidelines are as clear as, clear as they can be. Uh, if they go on the provincial site, they'll see it. And again, it's, a, it's up to the uh, local municipalities. If they want to change it, that's going to be uh, up to them. They, they have the right to under Section 22 of the Health Act. So um, I would recommend that they, they work with the, the local uh, chief medical officer's office and, and work through it because our, ours, are, ours are pretty stringent. So um, I'd work with them. Follow up. Thank you. And my follow-up question is actually about being tested uh, for COVID-19. I'm wondering if you and, and maybe Minister Elliott as well uh, could explain how that process went, uh, what it was like, and, and if it went smoothly. Yeah, it went, went smoothly. I, I just did it through abundance of caution. I stand up here every single day, and I've been tested after the, the PDAC conference a while ago at the beginning. And then, uh, you know, I tell everyone, go get tested. So I thought through abundance of caution, I better go get tested. And I skipped my press conference, went there and got tested, and I, it, you know it's it's quick and didn't hurt. You know you get a little water in your eyes, as everyone knows when they go there. But I encourage anyone that feels that they've been around uh, someone that had contacted COVID, then then go get tested. And that's that's the reason myself and the minister went immediately and and got tested. Next question. Next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan from City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Hi, uh, this question, hello. This question is actually for the health minister. Um, minister Elliott, online there is a photo of you circulating shopping in an LCBO store, uh, presumably or allegedly after you got your test and were awaiting results. Can you confirm if this is true? And is this an appropriate uh, thing to be doing after you've been tested and potentially exposed to somebody who was exposed to someone with COVID? 
Well, thanks for the question, Cynthia, and I'm happy to explain the situation. I decided to go for testing yesterday because Minister Lecce was being tested, and I had been at the press conference with him the day earlier. So uh, Minister Lecce's results came back negative before I went for testing, and so while there was no real need for me to go to be tested, uh, I had made a public commitment to do so, and so that's where I went. I went, and while I was at the assessment centre having the test, I was advised that because I had not directly been in contact with anyone with COVID, that I did not need to self-isolate. That was the medical advice that I was given, and uh, that is what I did. And my test results came back negative, of course. Follow up? Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Premier Ford, uh, surrounding long-term care. And Premier, I know you promised to put an iron ring around it, uh, but still, over 70% of the deaths in this province from COVID-19 have been in long-term care. Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to look into this and you've made a lot of promises about it, but do you think, particularly uh, in this case of which uh, Rob Ferguson just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the Woodbridge Centre, do you think your government failed to react quickly enough to put more in place to protect these vulnerable seniors long before the protections were put in place? First of all, my, my heart breaks for anyone that lost a, a loved one. It's, it's terrible. And to answer your question right up, did we fail? No, we didn't fail. We've thrown everything we can, every tool we had uh, at these long-term care homes. And if it was just, you know, if it was just Ontario, nowhere else around Canada or North America or the world, yeah, I'd say, okay, that we're doing something different. But we, we threw everything uh, we have at it and we're continuing to do that. We're gonna fix the problem and, and we're, we're gonna get this uh, straightened out. Uh, because it's, it's our duty to take care of the most vulnerable uh, people in society and to make sure we protect them and make sure they take care of the, the families, that they have uh, faith and trust that when they put a love, loved ones in long-term care, then they, they're going to be taken care of. And there's going to be, you know, there, there's, there's accountability. As I say, I take ownership of this and we're going to fix it. And... Uh, the eyes of the world are on everyone uh, on long-term care uh, here in Ontario, in the U.S., across Canada. Uh, but we are going to do everything we can uh, to get this uh, taken care of. We'll get it resolved. Next question. Next question comes from Victoria Gibson from iPolitics. Please go ahead. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Thanks for taking my question today. Thank you. I want to ask you, uh, actually, about your comments on Tuesday that you don't and have never believed in cutting police budgets. Yeah. Um, your government last year proposed a cut of approximately $46 million to the OPP. And I'm wondering in what way you think your government's actions then were different than some of the proposals that are arising in cities like Toronto right now to reduce or reallocate portions of police money. Well, when it came to the OPP, we, we drove efficiencies. But uh, what we did do, I think we threw over a billion dollars in the new communication systems. We built new OPT de uh, detachments. So we put a lot into infra infrastructure. Uh, going back to the question, I, I just don't believe that uh, police budgets should be cut. I think we need the police, and uh, there's a lot of things that we can improve in, in every sector, including the police. And you can talk to any police officer, they'll, they'll give you right off the top four or five things that they feel uh, they can improve on. So do we need uh, improvement? Uh, maybe better training, more uh, community policing, uh, more awareness? Uh, absolutely we do. But not to uh, not to cut them. It wasn't too long ago that when you called 911, you you know it'd take three or four minutes to even get an answer. They've corrected that problem, but uh, by no means safety is the number one priority, uh, along with with health. Obviously, is number one. But right behind it is safety. You you have an incident. Someone's breaking in your house. You want to have the police there instantly. You don't want to be waiting. And anyone who doesn't believe that, well, I guess they they haven't faced an issue when they are in desperate need of police. Follow up. 
sorry, just to follow up, um, you were on Toronto City Council and Vice Chair of the City's Budget Committee in 2011 when the mayor was at one point asking Toronto Police to find reductions of around 10%, mm -hmm. which is the same amount council, some councillors are currently proposing as redistributed from the police budget. Was this not an effort that you supported at the time? And if so, how do you square that with your comments earlier this week? Well, we drove efficiencies. We drove efficiencies right across the uh, city. We were the only government. When we went, went into office, the first words out of the uh, city manager's mouth is, welcome to the city of Toronto. We're $774 million of pressure going into the year. You can either drive efficiencies or you can start raising taxes by 20%. Well, I know, and I'll stand here today, there's waste at the provincial government that we're trying to drive efficiencies. There's waste at every municipal government, and there's waste at the federal government too. Uh, we need to drive efficiencies. And, and when we sat down and we talked to the police chief, Bill Blair at the time, uh, I think it was about 2.5% uh, efficiencies we found. But keeping in mind, 2.5%, uh, we still, uh, up to today, unless the new class of has come in, we, we're still four or 500 police uh, higher than we were today. So uh, driving efficiencies uh, doesn't, doesn't mean uh, cutting, it just means uh, making sure that we can reallocate that money to people that uh, need it in, in areas uh, that are needed. So, uh, you know, no one will ever convince me there's not waste in government. Any government, no matter if it's our government or any government, tries to tell you there's, there's no efficiencies to be had, uh, they just aren't being honest with you and they aren't being truthful. There's, there's more waste in government than you could ever shake a stick at. And we're going to find every single crumb of waste and drive efficiencies and reallocate those funds to places like long-term care that are needed. More, more to, uh, money to health as well. But uh, there's tons of waste in government. Next question. Next question comes from Alison Jones from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Alison. Hi, Premier. Um, on today's announcement, I know it's something that uh, a lot of families have been asking for for a long time, but I'm wondering what gives you um, the confidence to, to bring this in now. I know the, the numbers of homes in active outbreak are dropping, but at the same time, there are a number of homes that are somehow re-entering active outbreaks after their outbreaks have been resolved, including the home where your mother-in-law is. Yeah, yeah. So any, any uh, home with uh, that has an outbreak, they, they won't be able to visit. But uh, Alison, I'll tell you, I get asked this every single day by Carla. When can I see my mom? When can I? And I, it hits home. I, I hear. I, I, I just, I see even when we visit outside the window, I, I talk to other families. And so we, we have to be super, super careful when we do this and uh, put the proper protocols, which we have in place. And at the end of the day, it's going to be the home. That, that calls the, the shots. If they don't feel comfortable, um, you know, cooperate with the, the homes because most of them are phenomenal uh, places. But uh, again, um, we're going to do everything we can until you can see your loved ones. It means means everything to uh, people. Thank you. And on child care, um, you announced on Tuesday that centers could reopen Friday, but operators didn't get um, the government's 20 pages of new rules until 11.30 p.m. on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is actually enough time for any centre to get up and running by Friday? Well, this goes to child care and any uh, business moving forward we open. If you aren't ready, any child care centres don't open. There's, there's, there's not an emergency. You don't have to rush. Uh, just don't open. When you're ready to open, if it takes you a week, if it takes you 10 days, then take the week and 10 days. I'd rather be... Uh, careful so take your take your time there's no no emergency here next question next question comes from travis denrash from global news please go ahead hi travis hi there premier how you doing um this question uh good thanks this uh, question might be directed to you or perhaps uh minister fullerton okay. did the government suspend proactive and follow-up inspections of long-term care facilities in late march moving instead to a outreach model and if this did happen, do you think that decision impacted care and possibly cost lives as we continue to hear horror stories emerge of neglect at for-profit uh, care homes being unearthed almost on a weekly basis? Yeah, I'll pass that over to Minister Fullerton.
Thank you. So what, what we did with the inspectors, because of the uncertainty around uh, COVID, is we created uh, an action line for families to be able to communicate, for concerns to be raised, and uh, some of our inspectors were deployed to that as we worked through the process by which we could get the inspectors back into the homes. And so that's what happened there. The, the inspectors were also point people to make sure that the homes could get their PPE, that we could get any concerns raised by families or, uh, or residents or staff uh, addressed in an expedient way. The real issue surrounding um, uh, some of the homes that were in crises was staffing. Uh, staffing, as you know, was already in a crisis situation for long-term care as the new ministry was formed back in the summer of 2019, and we are actively addressing that uh, with a staffing study to inform a comprehensive staffing strategy. And so the staffing crisis uh, when hit by COVID um, in some homes uh, necessitated bringing in the armed forces, and so I'm very, very grateful uh, that we were able to call on the armed forces at that time. And the inspectors are, are now fully engaged in the homes uh, and that whole process has been worked out. But you can understand how challenging that uh, could have been at the very beginning of this, not understanding fully uh, the, the nature of spread of COVID. We were using the medical officer of health and, and those uh, directives and that expertise to inform our decisions um, and understanding that uh, this has happened across the world, devastating in our long-term care homes uh, and all measures were taken um, possible. Uh, to support our staff, our residents, and our homes during that process. Follow up. Thank you. Okay, I do have a question for for the premier, but I'm assuming that that does mean that you then move to an outreach model. Follow up, Travis. Okay, uh, premier. On another topic, uh, do you believe? I know you've talked about systemic racism in the general population, but do you believe if systemic racism is real in policing? in Ontario, and I'm specifically asking about police forces in this province. Well, I, I've said, uh, you know, numerous times here, yeah, there's, there's certain degrees of systemic racism everywhere, and we're going to put an end to it. And that, that's why, you know, I, I think a great leader, and I'm so sad to see him leave, is, is the Chief, Chief Saunders. You know, what a, what a leader he is. And I, I guarantee you, Travis, if we took a poll right now, uh, it would be if you want uh, the chief to continue on for three or four years, he'd be in 90%, I, I'd guarantee it. So, um, you know, I think we, there's a lot of things to be fixed uh, right across the, the board. Uh, but again, I never paint the brush, a uh, broad brush on, on everyone. Uh, with, with any group, you can, you can have uh, good and bad. Next question. Next question comes from Lisa Shing from CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi there, Premier. Hi. Uh, this question is about the nurses in the province. Uh, you are calling nurses heroes in the healthcare system, especially during the course of this pandemic. But nurses are angry that their recent arbitrated 1% pay increase doesn't really reflect what you're saying. They say uh, your government's bill to cap wage increases is unfair. So what do you say to the nurses in the province who say you're not putting your money where your mouth is? I'll pass it over to uh, the Minister of Health. Well, the nurses are heroes in our health care system. They have risen to the challenge. They have responded in our long-term care homes, in our hospitals, in home and community care settings. I know that there are some issues outstanding, but the matter was heard by the arbitrator. It was an independent process, uh, protected everyone's rights, and so that isn't something for us to question. That's outside of our jurisdiction, and, uh, but we remain committed to working with our nurses, and we are in recent communication with all of the, with ONA, with the uh, our NAO, with other organizations on a regular basis, and we um, we want to make sure that uh, we're able to address the issues that are within our jurisdiction whenever we have the opportunity to do so. Thanks very much. And this next question is also for the Minister of Health. Uh, it is from my colleagues in Ottawa. There's some concerns that masks discovered in the Renfrew paramedic supply uh, that were labeled not for medical use could be a province-wide problem. Uh, how much of a concern is this to you? Well, uh, we have inquired into that and uh, it was not part of our pandemic supply. That was not part of the province's 
uh, accumulation of personal protective equipment, but I think what it tells us is that as we go forward, we all need to be very careful if we're ordering PPE from another jurisdiction to make sure of its quality before we uh, order it and pay for it, and that we make sure that uh, it is appropriate for the use to which it's going to be put, um, even if it's donated. So we need to be very careful with that. But again, this particular supply was not part of the province-wide supply. Next question. Next question comes from Colin DeMello from CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, Colin. Hi there, Premier. Um, I'm glad to hear that uh, everyone is in good health. Uh, I think the whole province is happy to hear that. Uh, Premier, just talking about child care. Um, parents are looking forward to the return of child care. Many daycare providers, as you know, won't be able to open up tomorrow. I'm wondering why weren't child care centers actually given more of a heads up that this was going to be the date well in advance? Instead, a lot of them received the regulations, I believe, on Tuesday night, a few days before they were told that they could open. Why weren't they given that information before? Well, what I understand, uh, the child care protocols are relatively the, the same as the emergency services ones and uh, all the uh, folks that were bringing their uh, children there. So a lot of the child care uh, facilities had these protocols already in place because they obviously they got off to a, a better start. But it, again, Colin, it's, it's not an emergency that they have to open up uh, uh, now. They can, they can wait a few days. And in some of the, the areas, it shouldn't take too long, but uh, if they want to open up in, in a week's time, all the power to them. Some, some can do it, some can't, but again, there's no emergency for them to open up on this one certain time. Follow up. All right, thank you, Premier. And um, tomorrow is a pretty big day, I think, in this province. Social gathering rules are going to be expanded. Can you help kind of put a fine point on this? Because there seems to be a lot of confusion on there. So can an individual hang out with nine other people every single day or do they have to pick the same set of nine people to hang out with can those people come into our house again or do they have to stay outside and what level of interaction are we allowed to have with with these people can you guys help us figure all this out sure i'll pass it over to the minister of health Thank you. So there will be the opportunity for 10 people to get together, moving up from five people as long as there's the necessary physical distancing. However, we are also looking at uh, opportunities for family members, for other groups to get together. We are going to be discussing that in the very near future with you, but as far as uh, the present situation is concerned, it will be 10 people that can get together with physical distancing. Last question. Last question comes from Laura Stone from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, Laura. Hi, Premier. Um, I wanted to ask about today's announcement. I think there are uh, a lot of family members who would still be very concerned about some of the homes that are, are still in outbreak mm -hmm. and wanting to go not just visit their family members, but check in on them yeah. and make sure they're okay and actually contribute yeah. to their care. So is Ontario considering a designated caregiver, a family caregiver to be assigned to these homes? Will family members who are concerned about their loved one's well-being in homes that are in outbreak be able to go in and help them? I'll pass that over to Minister Smith. Well, you've heard the Premier say many times everything's on the table, and this is something that we're actively considering. Right now, um, we're really doing well with the homes, and for even during the, the peak of the, um, the COVID outbreak, 80% uh, of our homes were not in, in outbreak, or 70%, just going into the, uh, the peak, we were at about 80. So the majority of our homes were never in outbreak. And even uh, the outbreak can be a staff member self-isolating at home. So there's dozens of homes that were in outbreak that never had a case in the home itself. So we have to really look at the complexity of this and understand how we open up and make sure that our residents can get the support that they need from their family members when it's, it's safe to do so and when our staff can be supported by them as well. Understanding the staffing crises leading into this and in some homes, uh, the staffing collapse, which is why we had to bring in, in the military. So we value um, family members and friends and, and supporters for our, our long-term care homes. And uh, we're actively uh, addressing that. And once it's fully thought out and we're comfortable that, uh, and also getting the, um, 
the uh, consultations done with, uh, with our homes and the representative organizations, then, then we'll be moving forward. Thank you. And Premier, on yep. the military and the five homes, I believe their time is up June 12th, which is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that they've just arrived to two of the homes. So can you give us an update on the military's involvement in long-term care? Have you asked Ottawa to extend the armed forces deployment? And if not, how can you ensure that these homes, people in these homes will be receiving proper care? Well, I'd like the military to stay as, as long as possible, but Sorry, Laura. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this back to the Minister of uh, Long-Term Care, and then uh, and I, can I sidetrack? And I apologize, Laura. I'm just gonna I'm gonna pass it over to the Minister. But on on another on another note, I want to be real quick. I just want to thank uh, all the Chief Medical Officers, the great job they've done, and and Matt Anderson from Ontario Health. Uh, they they set a record uh, of 24,000 tests, and the numbers are down to 203. So I want to give them a shout out. I also, before we wrap up today, I want to give a shout out to the pharmacists and the technicians. Uh, you're doing a great job. I, I met a pharmacist over at uh, the hospital and said, hey, you know, you haven't given us a shout out, so I'm giving you a shout out. I really appreciate uh, everything you're doing. I apologize, Laura. I'm going to pass it over to the minister. Thank you. So clearly the, the military is not leaving uh, the homes uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is something that is uh, ongoing in discussion, and uh, we have um, active discussions to make sure that we can keep the military for as long as necessary. But our homes are, are working on providing stabilization plans so that there is clarity in terms of staffing, recognizing that that's a, a critical piece to making sure our residents can get the care that they need, and that is being done. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, everyone.